Hello, welcome to today's webinar on a successful international payload transformation. My name is Hans, I will be your host for the coming 30 minutes. And the session itself will be given by Rudy also in the call. Hi Rudy, how are you? I'm fine, Hans, thank you, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Now maybe start with an apology for the technical hiccup we discovered this morning. So the email addresses did not get through due to an integration issue. So thank you for registering again and being present in the call. Now before I give the floor to Rudy, allow me to briefly introduce Pabix and our business concept to you. So we are Pabix and we offer integrated payroll solutions across Europe, more specifically for 30 European countries. There's a service component in our solutions. The services are being delivered by our in-country payroll partners, the ICP. And we are busy selecting a, a partner in each country and we cover by now 14 countries. And by the end of the year, we will probably reach the full 30 countries in terms of partnership. And we, of course, also have developed the key component of integration, which is our payroll integration software, EPIX, that connects with all of the local payroll systems of our local partners. And if you go for the full setup, what we call unified processing, uh, the, you can, as a customer, have centralized input, so one tool for centralized input for those 30 countries. And you also have aggregated HR analytics at your fingertips available cross country and this is for all the 30 countries together or for some of them added together if you like. We have a mission and in fact we have two missions. We have a mission specifically for the international payroll professionals. We want to make your lives, your work more efficient, digital and integrated and for your employers we want to offer new added value and cost savings by integrating and digitizing your payroll processes. By the way, feel free to drop your questions and our comments in the chat box. You should see the chat box at the top right corner of your screen. I will keep an eye on the chat box and submit potential questions to Rudy as we move along. Okay. Let's move on to the subject of today. So how to organize a successful international payroll transformation. Let us start at the very beginning. By, this, by giving a high-level overview of the payroll process. As you all know, of course, a payroll process consists of two stages. The first is the customer sending its input to the payroll provider. Once received, the payroll provider performs a gross to net calculation and returns data, payslips, but also electronic data, calculated data to the customer for accounting and reporting purposes. Now, most of you, will have a payroll landscape like this. So whereas a national payroll process in most countries is rather well digitized and also well organized, we of course see differences between countries. Not every country reaches the same digitization maturity as the others. But as soon as you move to an international perspective, you will have a payroll landscape like the one here on the slide. Unless you use a tool such as SAP, but SAP is so expensive that it's out of reach for most international employers. So most of you will have a situation like this, where you have to work with a different tool per country and you immediately see the downside of such an architecture. Since the tools are, the tools are not connected, it is very hard to build an overview, a holistic overview across your countries. And you are forced to dive into each of the separate applications to get your European FTE headcount or labor cost. And so what we see is that for an international payroll professional, this landscape is like a real patchwork. And a patchwork may be, may be nice to look at, but it's quite a challenge, especially if you're after those aggregated holistic analytics that you want. And we all know that payroll is overwhelmed with questions from the business, uh, questions for drawing reports across several countries. So there's plenty of challenge to be handled uh, there. And so what we see is that the function of the international professional, well, it's one of the least digitized in most companies, and it has to do with the, the diversity between the countries, but also by the absence of a good technology. 
And the direct consequence for you is that you have to work often with the modern version of the Abacus, which is Excel. And we're all big fans of Excel, but we all know that Excel is not a payroll tool, right? period. We should all have tools in which we can directly enter our monthly data in which we should be able to do all the necessary tasks that relate to the function of an international payroll professional. Now, how do we get this uh, going? How do we get this moving towards uh, improvement? Everything starts with a vision. Uh, you also, as a payroll professional, should try to elaborate a clear vision about your future state. And once you have a vision, of course, you will also need a plan that you will try to manage carefully. It's, of course, also important. Now let's start with the vision. A key component that you should definitely integrate in your elaboration exercise of the vision is integration. And why is that? Integration brings substantial benefits. All the challenges that I mentioned until now can be dealt with if you make work of integration. And let's start with vendor management. You all agree there's quite a big difference between having to deal with one vendor on the one hand or 30 different, uh, potentially different uh, vendors for the whole of Europe. So that makes quite, quite a difference. Integration of payroll processes give you also access to a better overview of your full workforce, not having to dive in each of the separate uh, tools that you already have, but having somewhere at your fingertips KPIs available would make a very big difference. And last but not least, if you use one tool as your one and only input platform for your monthly input processes, stage one of the payroll process, remember, this will also make a dramatic difference in terms of efficiency gains. So that's why integration should really be at the heart of your future vision. Now, talking about integration, it's important to mention that you have different extents of gradations of integration. You can say today it's not really important to have nor input or output integration, yet you want to make sure that the partner that you choose in a specific country is ready to be integrated once you think it's necessary. So we can always start with making future-proof choices at the, at the very beginning of your international transformation journey. And then we move upwards towards integration of outputs. This means that you will keep on working with your local payroll applications for the input, yet we make sure that we gather all the electronic output of stage two of the payroll process and that we present this into an aggregated dashboard where you can find all your European HR KPIs. That's what we mean by integration of outputs. And then you can go all the way up to integration of inputs, which, only, which also contains, of course, integration of output. That's why we have here a two-way arrow there's integration in two ways. Here you use EPICS as your one and only input platform and obviously also as your platform to have your aggregated European HR KPIs. Now let me give you an example. We always encourage our customers to make a longer-term roadmap for this transformation. It is impossible to do everything at once. You should always plan this carefully, taking into account the capability that you have. You all have a lot of work. We hear that everywhere. So managing a transformation project comes on top. So that's why you should be careful with the planning. And that's why you should do things step by step. And in this example, you have eight countries headquartered in Italy with big subsidiaries in Germany and Slovakia. Obviously, in the starting state, they are not connected, so no overview, no efficient gains whatsoever. This is the starting state. Well, in the first stage, we could consider migrating a few countries towards a state of integration, and uh, as I mentioned, not do everything at once. So in a second stage, your picture could look like this one on the slide. Already five countries integrated into your integration platform EPICS, but as you can see, for the bigger sites, such as Italy, Germany, and Slovakia, we start with only an output integration. So we capture the electronic output of your current payroll providers, integrate that into the dashboard of EPICS. And for the smaller countries, since their migration is less impactful, we go all the way for a two-way integration. So that means that for those countries, we manage the input from that moment onwards in, in EPICS but already five countries integrated in EPICS. And then we can go one step further and address the remaining countries. 
And there in stage three, you can see that all the eight countries are now connected with EPIX. So you will have the full overview of all your countries in EPIX. But you will still see that there's two, uh, two types of integration. For the bigger sites, it is still the output integration only. And for the smaller entities, it's a two-way integration. And you could go even further. You, can, you could then consider centralizing your team since they all work for the smaller countries on EPIX. So the message is here, make a long-term roadmap that you can organize at your own pace, taking into your account uh, your own capability. So, so far for the roadmap and the vision, now Rudy can tell you a lot more about how to organize such a transformation. Rudy, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Hans, for the nice introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, in its latest market analysis of the payroll industry, the analysts of Nelson Hall showed that multi-country payroll outsourcing is growing four times faster than single-country outsourcing. They state that this is driven by the demand to support a common operating model and a greater control of payroll processes globally. So, if you hear that, maybe the time is right to investigate yourself if multi-country payroll outsourcing can also offer you some interesting benefits. But as with all challenges, it's best not to jump in head first. Your first step will be to clearly formulate the why. The why it means that we'll need to seek the answers to questions such as what is the financial reward for allocating human resources and company capital to this initiative? How will outcomes improve our HR and or finance operating model? And for instance, how will this contribute to a better experience for our payroll professionals, employees and managers? So if we then look at the why and how we can make that totally clear, well, what you could do is you could use what we've called the five C's. So for each of the C's, we'll try to define an answer as to the why. The first C is the one on compliance. As we all know, payroll is very much about compliance, no errors, flawless, timely, accurate, you name it. We can think about payroll calculations as such, but also statutory reporting. The payments, uh, the payments of the salaries timely in the bank, internal and external audits are uh, more and more uh, prevalent. And also certifications, if you want to certify for our processes, think of Sarbanes-Oxley or whatever other process uh, certifications, it comes to the surface for international payroll. The second uh, C is the C for costs. Uh, and here as well, we all see that the uh, cost for talent and for technology and integration expenses are constantly uh, increasing. And if we want to do something about it, well, we need to tell uh, our uh, stakeholders and our board how are we going to do this? The third one is on control. Um, in an international context, you want to have your KPI, KPIs at your fingertips uh, because it's very difficult to keep control if you don't have those. And the same goes for labor costs and even for fraud. Uh, uh, in a payroll, it happens too often that there's possibilities for fraud and you want to close off those possibilities. Number four is consolidation. So when you look at consolidation, you look around and you see that the processes that you currently are running in multiple countries often are dissonant. They, they don't match, they don't, uh, they're not harmonized or whatever. And you, you probably want to go into a more uh, you know, qualify, a qualitative uh, process uh, management. And the same goes for the tools. Uh, here as well, uh, every country will have its own tools. People are sometimes reluctant to give them up. But if you want to go for a more consolidated, centralized, controlled uh, payroll function, this is something you need to tackle. Last but not least, continuity. Uh, uh, we need to make sure that the technology uh, we're using today, the providers we're using today, even our talent that we're using today, will still is still fit for the future. And not the near future only, but also the mid-term and even the long-term future. So, uh, having done this first step uh, as defining the why uh, and, and explaining the why to the people who need to hear it, then we can go to the next step. And uh, Hans already mentioned it, uh, make sure to, to have a plan. Who fails to plan, plans to fail is definitely also applicable to an international payroll transformation project. In such a plan, 
we can distinguish three stages. And the first one is the preparation stage. Then you go for the information state. And finally, you have the determination stage. So if we now look at the full plan, okay, this is a bit too detailed. I'm not going to elaborate everything. But in preparation, basically, what we're doing here is setting up for success. And uh, we're doing some housekeeping, making sure that the project uh, team is, is formed, that people are in, uh, in, informed, get interested in our project as well, so that we can get some support within the company. In the information stage, uh, once that is done, we can go to an information stage. And then it's about testing the possibilities and the opportunities that are prevalent in the payroll industry. Now, be aware, there, uh, no, this, it's a complex, uh, I would call it a labyrinth or even a jungle sometimes, this industry. So uh, tread carefully here and make sure that you f have a good understanding of what the possibilities and opportunities are. And we need this information before you can decide whether actually going international makes really sense for us. Eh? Because it takes time, it takes some, some effort, and it takes some uh, investment as well. And then finally, in the last stage, the determination stage, we're going to paint the full picture of how our international payroll transformation will look like. And that will allow us to fully inform our executives for the initiative and to seek approval for it. Without approval from the executives, you're probably not going to be able to go to step three, uh, or you don't want to start with step three. And step three is an important one, and sometimes a little bit overlooked in, the, in such a, and, and it's, again, it comes with some work, but it will give you great uh, results if you go through it. So what is it? It's covering the payroll as a state. So what are you going to do is you're going to have a good view on processes, activities, and tasks in each of the countries, uh, how they deliver the end-to-end -end payroll services. Uh, you need to also understand which employees in the organization are actually contributing to your payroll service delivery. And it's not only the payroll people themselves. Often there's also uh, in other functions like HR and IT and finance. Uh, the business, eh? let's not forget, there are also people spending time on payroll and you probably want to capture the time they spend eh? if you want to have a full picture. Thirdly, the providers, the contracts and the payroll software uh, and hardware that are spread around uh, your organization. So that's not even, it's, it can be hard to find a, a contract even uh, with, with a local payroll provider. Uh, but, you know, you need to go through it and you need to understand when uh, you can actually uh, you know, uh, transition from your incumbent payroll provider to potentially a more international payroll provider because it can be an inhibitor. Then we have the integrations uh, between the payroll and non-payroll systems. Also, Hans mentioned it already. It's all about the integration these days. Now, currently, what you will see if you do this exercise, there's integration spread all over the place because you have local payroll systems the, the number of integrations multiplies and actually that's one of the things you probably want to get rid of and make sure that's much more streamlined in the future and then last but not least of course it's always about pecunia what is the cost that we are currently assuming to uh, actually deliver our payroll all over uh, the world all over the globe in the multiple countries that we're in and be aware uh, if you really start adding it all up uh, and look in the small corners also of where there's still some costs hidden, uh, you may be surprised of how much you're paying today for your uh, multiple local payroll provisioning. So quite a bit of a job, but uh, uh, we, uh, we can help you uh, at least a little bit, uh, uh, put you on the road. Uh, we've prepared for you a payroll template. Uh, just send us a quick email, you'll get it. And it gives you the chance to structure your SS, uh, uh, cost and, and process exercise, finding, uh, finding out how, how it runs. So quick email to info at paybix.eu, and it's in your mailbox before you know it. OK, on to step four. Sorry if I'm going a bit too quick, but maybe, but you know, in the interest of time. So with step four, we actually can start um, doing our exercise going to market, as they call it. Right? Going to market, your first step is an RFI process. Yeah, an RFI process, you can do it. Or you can run it completely yourself. What you could also do is you could ask the services of a, an international payroll outsourcing advisor who maybe in a few days' times can actually bring you fully up to speed of how this market, this industry is actually organized uh, and served. Um, so you can also, of course, when you do it yourself, you're going to start with desk research. Huh? Dr. Google will help you here. Um, 
Uh, and you do this desk, desk research because you want to understand in the first place which providers would actually suit your requirements, your needs uh, uh, for your, uh, your endeavor. And you need to think about uh, geographical things like geographical scope, functional requirements, company size and so because the last thing you want to do is send your RFI to a what they call an MCPO, a multi-country payroll outsourcing provider that actually is totally not fit. Uh, if you're, for instance, I'm just giving you an example, if you're only in one region, why would you send your, you could involve global global players, but maybe these global players are not that interested because you're only in one region and maybe your size is not not, not fit into their you know, sweet spots of their startup, 15,000, 20,000 employees, the, the likes of ADP in an international context, ADP and Alight and Ceridian, they start at 15,000, 20,000. If you're below that number, you probably not want to go there. There's plenty of others, so don't, don't worry. Um, so preparing the RFI, how do we do that? We structure and mandate the format for the provider's response. Very important. You don't want to go free format. You go crazy if you read all the answers in all the different formats. You say, okay, this is how we want you, dear candidate, provider, MCPO, how you want you to respond to our RFI. Uh, you're going to include uh, some information about your company. Very important. Educate them so they don't miss the ball. And then you're going to request uh, some information from the providers, of course, obviously. So if we then look at what would be um, the content of such information to the candidates is first, first of all, generic company information, you know, what business are you in, how are you structured, where are your business units, where are your people, things like that. What do you use today in, as, as solutions for your, uh, for your payroll? Then very important. You're going to have to describe your calls for change. Remember the five C's we started with, this is the calls for change. Let the candidates know that you're serious about this exercise. And the last thing you want to do is sending it out to 10 potential MCPOs. They look at it and they say, well, okay, we classify this, we, we qualify this as a non-compete, non non-pursuit, because they are not serious about it. By telling them what the calls for change is, they will understand. Also your goals for the project. For them, it's important to understand how can, can we really answer to these goals of this customer, or should we say, well, we're a bit too small or a bit whatever, we're not in this region and we should not go for this custom. What are your high level requirements at this point in time? Don't go too much into detail, just the pure high level. Uh, we come back in the RFP to go more uh, in detail. And then the assist volumes and technology, again, the exercise that we've done in step three, well, we're gonna, you're gonna uh, communicate these in transparency to the candidates, again, in the interest of making, being serious about things. And your timings. So what do you expect, actually? And not only the timings for the uh, for the for the process, the, go, the the selection process, but also your timings going forward for your project itself. How do you want to roll out? Uh, what is what do you think is realistic? And put it already in your RFI. Okay, that's the information we give. Now we need to request some information, of course, also from the back, obviously. So it's about capabilities. Uh, so so that at least you can you can understand what their capabilities are. Uh, it's about the proposed solutioning. So from your uh, case for change, from your high level requirements, from your goal setting, they should be able already to give you, again, it's still high level, we're in RFI phase, not RFP, uh, they give you a high level proposed solutioning. And again, indicative pricing, uh, ranges of pricing between this and that uh, frame. Again, if they all follow the same structure as you mandate, then it should be easy to compare them and you don't have to normalize every time, everything. Step four is done. We get the information back. Eh? Suppose that there was some good responding. Uh, we go back to our board or the steering committee or whatever who needs to give the nod to pursue uh, you know, the, the business case. Okay, the, we're going to use this, uh, these responses, of course, uh, to the RFI to present the business case uh, because we will now have answer to uh, questions such as how can we solve our issues and needs? Do we solve them all or do we still need to do some uh, uh, some each in items ourselves in-house, uh, what remains unsolved, we could say, uh, also important to, to clarify. Uh, then, which challenges uh, will we need to overcome? Uh, there's, there's, there's definitely challenges about time, effort that you need to put in such a project, and maybe you need to ask for extra people to backfill uh, the people who are now currently doing a payroll and 
you know, do you need to release them to work on this project? Uh, the high level budget that is needed. Uh, remember, we have high level pricing. We have our SS cost, and we should now be able actually to present a high level uh, budget and savings, uh, which is the other, the next point, the savings that you can make still high level. And then last but not least, what are the quality improvements potentials of this? Uh, because it's all, we're, we're not doing this just for the fun. We uh, want to do this to improve end-to-end uh, -end payload solutions. So step five done and present it to uh, the board again. Say, uh, go back to the steering committee, say, okay, we now have this business case. Are you okay for us to go one step further and now really become <laughs> absolutely serious because we're going to go in the selection process for uh, a, a final candidate? Again, what we same thing as with the RFI, again, mandatory table of contents, and then you collect uh, the other functions needs. Go around, go to the tour of the functions eh? uh, for two things. One, you will understand what they need, eh? what their requirements are eh? for an international payroll project. Again, think HR, payroll, the business, eh? not, for, not to forget. Uh, but also you will get the support from them. If you need at certain point in time, you need resources into your project, you can get the, the support there. You're going to refine your requirements because you know a lot more now. You can think of the statement of services. What do we include in our uh, outsourcing initiative? What are the service level performances that we accept, expect from uh, the, um, the winner? Uh, what is the technology that we, that not, well, you, you cannot prescribe too much here, but you can, can give an indication. Then integrations uh, also, uh, you need to understand reporting analytics. And five, last but not least, the pricing sheet template. Uh, here again, we can help you with that also, is um, you, know, you, you prescribe the way they need to price your, uh, uh, you know, uh, the services. Yeah. Because you want to have an easy comparison. Uh, what you can include here in the pricing template is how they need to present the one-off project fees. Important, uh, very detailed. You want to keep that very detailed. The recurring services fee, obviously, uh, and the maintenance fee. Don't forget, uh, uh, what is, uh, ask them what is included, what is not included, uh, and what is new, do we need to pay extra in view of maintenance. Uh? There's a difference between patching, updating, and upgrading, for instance. Uh, technology costs and daily rates levels and things like that. Okay, so step six, six done. We are, have our information, we have our candidate, and maybe a, a backup uh, on, the, on the back burner uh, in case it doesn't work out with number one and we received back the, um, you know, the full RFPs. We have all the information, we've had multiple meetings, and now we can actually go for the final presentation with all that information, we present the final business case, and we seek approval, uh, final approval, uh, before we start the project from the stakeholder, uh, the steering committee, sorry, uh, stakeholders as well, um, and from the board, uh, potentially at this, at this point in time, definitely the board will also have want to have a say in this. Um, first thing, again, we roll back to our first step, the why, and we need to show, okay, will it be resolved, yes or no? Is the why uh, okay, and can we go ahead? Secondly, target operating model, always a very important element in uh, you know, a presentation of a business case. What is the impact on people? What is the impact on process? And what is the impact on technology? Given a few examples of what's in there. And then, uh, as already mentioned earlier, it's all about pecunia. At the end of the day, uh, you, uh, your board will want to see what the investment is that needs to be done in this, in people and in money, uh, what are recurring costs in the future, uh, and uh, how will quantitative and qualitative return on investment look like. With this seventh step, we, we've done them all. Uh, it's not seven since, since, but seven steps is better. So wrap up, uh, first step, uh, go back to the why. Uh, always start with the why, remember the five Cs, plan the international payroll project who fails to plan, plans to fail. Uncover the payroll as a state, use our template, it's easier. Run a request for information briefly, uh, present the preliminary business case. Then your final RFP process can be done. It's all fun, uh, believe me. And then at the end of the day, you can present your final business case and seek approval for your project. And uh, the only thing I can say is good luck and you know, try to keep the fun high because it's, it's really an interesting exercise to do if you have the time. Good, um, that was it for me. Um, maybe just uh, an appeal to you to, to really um, uh, sign up for our uh, next demo. The next demo uh, of our payroll epics, the, the one that uh, Hans was already explaining in the beginning. It's really worth having a look. Um, you know, I don't want to post uh, uh, my trumpet here too hard, but I can tell you in the 40 years I've been in the payroll business, this is the first time I've seen such a, um, such a solution, so yeah. 
it's worth having a look. Okay, thank you, Rudy. I'm looking at the chat box, but there's no question or comment there, so I think you have been very clear. Uh, now, before we wrap up the call, let me also briefly show this screen to you. Just after the closing of this call, we kindly invite you to fill in a brief uh, questionnaire about uh, the added value of this webinar so all comments are welcome negative or positive we always try to learn from feedback from our customers and, and, and viewers so it will only take two minutes and uh, the screen will appear right after the closing of this call so that's it for now once again if there are any questions that could pop up in the further future you can always reach out to us you see our email addresses here on the screen and so for now, thanks for watching, and we hope to see you in one of our future events. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.